This is a sermon from St. Paul's Church, Brookfield, Connecticut, transforming lives through Jesus. For more information, go to www.stpaulsbrookfield.com. Grace to you and peace, beloved community in Christ. Please be seated. It is a joy to come together in the spirit, isn't it? To capture God's vision together, which is the heart of this message. Spiritual vision. And as Proverbs tells us, without a vision, God's people perish. And so crying out to Jesus as the way and the truth and the life is to call out for God to give us that gift of fresh vision, which is what we need. Wherever you are right now, may God create in you, in your heart, a new vision for your life and our life together, that as we emerge from this challenging time, we will have an ongoing and creative and alive vision together that God is giving us to experience Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life in the days ahead. Jesus gives us our theme this morning when it comes to spiritual vision, when he says this in our gospel, for if you know me, you will know my father also. You already know him and have seen him. Let those words speak to you because they tell us that spiritual vision is about knowing and seeing. Knowing and seeing. And that's what we'll look at this morning through the characters in our readings today, beginning with Stephen, the first martyr. And without Stephen, how can we possibly think about Paul? also known as Saul of Tarsus. And then we'll look at ourselves, the ongoing characters in God's story. All of us who are called to experience spiritual vision in Christ. Let's start with Stephen. He was one of seven deacons chosen by the original apostles. They were getting busier and busier proclaiming the good news, working miracles in Jesus' name. And so they appointed these deacons to serve the people of God. And in addition to being a true servant, Stephen the deacon was also a mighty preacher we see. He offers one of the strongest sermons in the New Testament. As he's brought before his accusers, he preaches to them. He preaches the whole history of Israel to them and shows them that time and time again, God's people have resisted the new move of the spirit among God's people and they were no different and they had rejected Jesus and as they're listening and listening and he's preaching and preaching with even more power, he suddenly sees something. He says, I see the heavens opened and I see the son of man standing at the right hand of God and that's all they can handle and they stone him. You see, he had knowledge and he could see his opponents. Oh, they had knowledge, but they could not see. And like our Lord Jesus Christ, Stephen's death captured the heart of what it means to have spiritual vision. Remember when Jesus was on the cross, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Which is, by the way, a quote from our psalm today, Psalm 31, verse 5. And he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Look how Stephen died. He said, Jesus, receive my spirit. And he said, Jesus, do not hold this sin against them. Notice he mirrored the very forgiveness Christ offered from the cross. And he shows us that to have spiritual vision, one sign of that is to have a heart of forgiveness. Even in the most challenging times, he, as he goes to his death, is committing himself to God and asking for the forgiveness for others. As God gives us spiritual vision, May we see the sign of it happening in our lives as forgiveness comes out from us. And not just forgiveness for others, but forgiveness for ourselves. And to make this point, we now look to this young man named Saul of Tarsus, who we are told was overseeing Stephen's stoning. The very first martyr of the church was killed essentially at the hands of Saul of Tarsus, later to become Paul. Now, who was Saul of Tarsus? Well, he knew a lot. He was one of the most learned Pharisees of his time. 
He had studied under the great Rabbi Gamaliel. He was righteous and zealous in enforcing the law of God, and he was actively hunting down people of the way. That is what Christians were first called, people of the way. And after Stephen's death, Saul of Tarsus went to the high priest and he said, may I have letters, please, to go to the synagogue in Damascus to round up men and women and to bring them back to Jerusalem under arrest. So Saul of Tarsus is on his way to Damascus when suddenly he has a vision. He falls to the ground. He can't see anything, but he hears a voice say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he says, who are you, Lord? And the voice says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And we're told that those around him traveling with him, they couldn't see anything, but they could hear the voice. And so they walked Saul of Tarsus in his blindness to a house in Damascus. And meanwhile, the Holy Spirit was speaking to a man named Ananias, a person of the way. And the Spirit of God told him to go to this Saul of Tarsus on a street called Straight at the house of a man named Judas. And he at first thought, Lord, how can this be? This man, Saul of Tarsus, is a known murderer of my people. How can I go to him? And he was instructed to go to him and to pray for him to receive the Holy Spirit in his sight. So Ananias goes to Saul and he says, Saul, the Lord Jesus, the same one who met you on the road, has told me to pray the Holy Spirit over you and to give you sight. And he prays over Saul and Saul experiences something like scales falling from his eyes and he can suddenly see. And then he's baptized. And then he will become the one we know as Paul, the apostle of all apostles to the Gentiles. The one for whom this church is named. Now, Paul, who had incredible knowledge, couldn't see a thing. All of a sudden, as he receives the Holy Spirit, he can see. And that's the heart of spiritual vision. Back to Jesus. If you know me, you will know my Father also. For you now know, know him and have seen him. We see with the miracle of a heart change. We see with the eyes of the heart. And this is why Paul would pray for the churches all the time, including the church in Ephesus. One of the best scriptures to make this point is Ephesians 1.18, where Paul says this, I pray that you, and essentially Paul is praying for all of us right now with this prayer, I pray that you would have your hearts enlightened, that you would know the hope to which you've been called, the glorious riches of of God's people. This echoes that beautiful proclamation from our epistle this morning from Peter, that you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You know, Saul of Tarsus could not see this. In fact, he wanted to kill anybody that didn't think the way he thought. But like Stephen preached, the Spirit's always moving among God's people. And only the Holy Spirit can enlighten the heart and allow us to see things the way God sees things, including being able to forgive. Paul had to forgive himself. He wrote most of the New Testament, and we see that in his writing in many places where he knows the terrible things that he did, and now he can preach all about forgiveness because he's experienced the forgiveness of Christ. And he has learned to forgive himself. And so it is with us. As we are given spiritual vision, may we, yes, forgive ourselves and forgive one another. For this is why Jesus laid his life down on the cross to die for our sins. And he rose again to send the Holy Spirit to enlighten our hearts that we might see the new things that God is always doing in our midst. And so now this comes to us. We've looked at Stephen and Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul. What about you and what about me? What is God doing in our hearts by way of enlightenment right now? How might the Holy Spirit be moving in you right now to unleash forgiveness for yourself, for others, and to start to see God's people as God sees them? A chosen race a royal priesthood, and a holy nation. 
C.S. Lewis, the Anglican writer, wrote about such a concept in his work called The Weight of Glory. I'd like to just recount some of that for us as we think about this. To make the point that we are chosen for eternity, that we have a destiny of glory, he said things like this. You've never spoken to a mere mortal. There are no ordinary people. If you could see the other person next to you for what they were going to one day be in Christ, you would want to fall down and offer worship, perhaps. He wrote, There are things in this life that are mortal, things that are passing away, like nations, cultures, civilizations, art. The life to these things is really just like a, a gnat compared to the life that we experience around our fellow immortals. He says that those that we work with, those that we joke with, those that we marry, those that we snub and exploit, these are immortals. The closest thing next to the blessed sacrament itself that we will ever sense in this world that is that powerful, that holy, is your very neighbor. The point is, we are crafted for glory in Christ. God has set eternity in the human heart. And as God moves in us through the Holy Spirit and opens our hearts up, we begin to see one another as God sees us. A chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. May God give us that vision to see one another with such divine vision that we are created for good works in Christ, that we are God's glory, God's crown, even now. And as the church, as the beloved community of Christ, we are privileged to take the lead on this as we emerge from this difficult time of quarantine and isolation with a new vision to show the world, a world that too often is in strife, cannot see the way God sees, and is full of hate. We have the privilege to take the lead, to show another way, the way of Jesus, the way of seeing one another as immortal in Christ. Those to be held with such honor, such love, such majesty. This is the heart of spiritual vision, as God shows us how precious we are in God's sight, that we have been bought with a price, purchased with the price of Christ's own blood. It's through worship and prayer. It's through study of God's word. And it's through service that that vision comes into focus more and more. And it's happening, my friends, right now. And in the days ahead, we will walk in that one vision together in Christ. And so... Like the beloved disciple John, if we could go to another writer in the Bible, in his first letter, chapter 3, verse 2, he says this, and let this pour over you through the Spirit, these words of God. Beloved, we are now God's children, and what we will one day be has not been revealed, but we know this, that when he appears, we will see him as he is, and we will be like him. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation. Live into that love, live into that destiny, and let us see with spiritual vision all that God has for us in Christ now and tomorrow. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.